years as we are in 1997, from the creation of the soul of Adam. Not the body, but the soul of Adam. So we have a clock that begins with Adam, and the six days are separate. They're separate from this, this clock. So now the Bible has two clocks. That might seem like a modern rationalization if it were not for the fact that Talmudic commentaries 1,500 years ago bring that information down. In Vayikra Rabbah, Leviticus Rabbah, which is an expansion of the Talmudic text, which is an expansion of the biblical text, chapter 29, verse 1, we're told that everyone agrees that Rosh Hashanah commemorates the soul of Adam and that the six days of Genesis are separate. Now, 1,500 years ago, when this information was first recorded, it wasn't that, for instance, one of the biblical rabbis like Hillel, here's a knock on his door and his young kid comes in and says, oh, yeah, but you can't believe we went, to a, we went to a museum today and we saw all information about billions of year old universe. And Hillel says, yeah, Rabbi, I better change the Bible. Let's keep the six days separate. That wasn't what was happening. You have to put yourself in the mind frame of 1,500 years ago. When people traveled by donkeys. Why were the six days taken out of the calendar? Why is not clear from the text, but we'll get into it in a moment. But nonetheless, they were taken out. Taken out at a time when there was no need to make them separate. The reason that they're taken out is because the time is described differently in those six days of Genesis. There was evening and morning. There was evening and morning, day by day. A totally bizarre way, bizarre being exotic, not usual way of describing time. Once you come from Adam, the flow of time is totally in human terms. Adam and Eve live 130 years, the father of Seth. Seth lived, the parents of Seth. Seth lives 105 years, the father of Enosh. From Adam forward, the flow of time is totally human in concept. But prior to that time, it's almost as if you have an abstract concept. There was evening and morning. More things happening. There was evening and morning. A way as if you're looking down on events from a viewpoint that is not intimately related to them. And that pretty much is the, is, would be the key to, in fact, trying to understand the, the flow of time during these six days. In trying to understand the flow of time here, we have to remember that the entire six days is described with 31 sentences. There are 31 verses from in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth through the end of the appearance and creation of mankind, the end of chapter 1. The six days of Genesis, which have given people so much headache in trying to understand science in the Bible, are confined to 31 sentences. At MIT in the Heiden Library, we had about, I would guess, about 50,000 books that deal with the cosmology, the high energy physics of the creation, the, the chemistry, the thermodynamics, the paleontology, the archaeology. Up to the river at Harvard, at the, at the, at the Widener Library, they probably had 200,000 books on these same topics. Not Bible topics, but the science of the, of the Big Bang, the science of the development of the universe. The Bible, instead of giving us hundreds of thousands of books, gives us 31 sentences. Don't expect my simple reading of those 31 sentences to know every detail that is held within the text. Okay? Understand we have to dig deeper to get the information out. Now, the idea of having to dig deeper is not a rationalization. In fact, in the chapter, the second chapter of the Talmud Hagiga, Hag meaning holidays, okay? The second chapter of the Tal section of the Talmud Hagiga, the Talmud becomes intrigued with the, with the creation of the universe and especially with these six days of Genesis. And the Talmud tells us that from the opening sentence of the Bible, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, through the Yehudu HaShemayim, thus the heavens and the earth were completed, the beginning of chapter 2. In other words, the 31 sentences, the six days, the Talmud tells us the entire text is given in parable form. A poem with a text and a subtext. Now, again, put your mind in, into the mindset of 1,500 years ago, the time of the Talmud. Why would the Talmud think it was parable? What, you think they didn't, uh, 2000, 1,500 years ago, the time of the Talmud, they thought that God couldn't make it all in six days? That it was a problem for them? Oh, we may have a problem today with, with cosmology and scientific data. But 1,500 years ago, what's the problem with six days? No problem. So with these sages, 
pulled the six days out of the calendar and said that the entire text is parable. It wasn't because they were trying to apologize away what they'd seen in the local museum. There was no local museum. No one was out there digging up ancient fossils and saying, wow, I found ancient fossils. The fact is the text tells you it's parable. If your close reading of the text makes it clear that there's information hidden and folded in below the superficial reading. And this is what, in fact, King Solomon wrote in Proverbs 25.11. A word well spoken is like apples of gold in dishes of silver. A word well spoken is like apples of gold in dishes of silver. And Maimonides said, what was Solomon talking about? What could King Solomon mean? Why should a word well spoken be like an apple of gold in dishes of silver? And he answers the question. He says, when you look at a dish from a distance, what you see is the dish. The beautiful silver dish. Valuable, eternally, or long-lasting. Only when you bring the dish close in, do you see what's in it. The apples of gold. The silver dish, Maimonides says, the silver dish is the literal reading of the text of the Torah. Beautiful. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for 3,000 years have been a bestseller. The golden apples, the subtleties inside the text that expand the meaning way beyond the literal meaning. And, and Maimonides says, as gold is more valuable than silver, these golden apples blow the meaning apart, expand it way beyond the simple reading of the text. The idea of looking for a deeper meaning in Torah is no different than looking for a deeper meaning in science. It's not a rationalization. And just as we look for the deeper readings of science, you have to look for the deeper readings in the text. And that's what King Solomon was saying, and that's what Maimonides expanded on it. Thousands of years ago, we learned that there are subtleties in the text that expand the meaning way beyond. And it's those subtleties I want to see. Among the early sources that tell us that the calendar is a two-part calendar, even predating Leviticus Rabbah, which goes back almost 1,500 years, which says it explicitly, Moses, in his closing speech, implies this to be the case. In Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 7, in the closing speech that Moses makes to the people, he says, in, a, in essence, if you want to see the fingerprint of God in the universe, and this is how he continues, consider the days of old, the years of the many generations. Deuteronomy 32, 7. If you want to see the fingerprint of God in the universe, consider the days of old, the years of the many generations. And the Kabbal Nachmanides, in the name of Kabbalah, says, why does Moses break the calendar into two parts? Consider the days of old, the years of the many generations. The consider the days of old, Nachmanides says, Sheshet Yemei Breshit, the six days of Genesis, the years of the many generations, all the time from Adam forward. You can see God's figure in the universe one of two ways. Look at the phenomena of the six days and the, and the development of a universe which is mind-boggling or if that doesn't ex impress you then just consider society from Adam forward okay either way you'll find the imprint of God okay but now leaving from Adam forward apart let's jump back to the six days of Genesis and try to see how we can find in the six days of Genesis that are separate from the world the 15 billion years First of all, we now know that when we write the biblical calendar that says 5,758 years, we have to add a bit to that, plus six days. Ah, so now when my youngest daughter, Hannah, years ago when she was just seven years old, and my wife had brought me a dinosaur fossil from the northwest of the U.S., where she was doing some research for a book, brings a dinosaur fossil to the house, 150 million years old, dated by two radioactive decay chains. If you visit me in Jerusalem, I'm happy to show you the dinosaur fossil, the vertebra of a plesiosaurus. So Hannah says, Abba, dinosaurs? How can there be dinosaurs 150 million years ago when the Bible teacher tells me the world isn't even 6,000 years old? So what I said to Hannah was, if you look in Psalms, Psalm 90, verse 4, you find something quite amazing. In Psalm 90, verse 4, the psalmist, King David, says, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that passes. And within Psalm 90, there is a core of a deeper truth. But we have to look for the deeper truth in Psalm 90 than just saying what the days of eras. Now, I have many colleagues 
who remain friends, but we disagree on this point, that say that the days were eras, okay? As Psalm 90 says. But we'll start with the problem with this, taking the days as eras, as you get older and you start doing Talmudic studies or start studying biblical commentary in depth, you find that problems arise out of taking the days as eras.